This is about your journey in music and how you got to where you are now. Um, whereabouts did you grow up? I grew up in Lexington, Kentucky. Kentucky. Tell me about that. How's that? I mean, you know, when you're not from anywhere else, you don't know how el you know how different that is from anybody else's life. But I will give you this in context. I spent, I'd say, a majority of my childhood in Lexington, Kentucky. But then I moved to New York and I lived in New York City for five years okay. from the time I was nine to 14. Now, that was a stark contrast. I can't even imagine. <laughs> from growing up in a, you know, Lexington is a city, but it is it is a city that is essentially surrounded by horse farms. Okay. So you have this nucleus of the city with buildings and, and that's in the center. And then it's a, a neighborhoods and suburbs right on the outside. It's like a circle. And then the next level of the, the, the circle, <laughs> that's all horse farms. Wow. So, you know, when I was going to dance class as a kid, we would go down this country road. There were only two lanes on. And everybody's like, oh, be careful on Paris Pike. You know, people pull out and die all the time. <laughs> you know, so that was, that was, was growing up. And I, I went to dance school at a place called Town and Village School of Dance. It was in a shopping center with a Kentucky fried chicken and a pizza hut. <laughs> and nice. it was like my treat <laughs> after I had my, my dance class that I was going to get some mashed potatoes from Kentucky fried chicken or... I got to stay and my friends and I would go to Pizza Hut wow. together, you know, so it was you know, small town life, but mm -hmm. I learned, you know, I have such great memories and I, I loved, I loved growing up there. I loved, I love wide open spaces, which is why I think I'm moving to a farm now. I was just going to say that kind of, you're kind of coming back full circle. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I need, I need space for my eyes to see. You know, I, I need that. Um, and, and that was nice, you know, growing up with that kind of freedom in terms of space. Mm -hmm. And I rode horses as a kid. And um, I also did theater and sang and did all that kind of stuff too. But, sure. um, and high school was particularly fun. When did you start music? Because you're talking about dancing and obviously you were an actor. Um, so when was the music kind of integrated into your life? Well, my dance teacher, um, Miss Luann, Miss Luann Franklin, told my mom that during dance class, when she turns the songs on, I was singing um, very loudly <laughs> while the kids were trying to learn the dance routine. Okay. And she said to my mom that she thought that actually I was pretty good and that she might want to put me in singing lessons and said, she really is singing out. Mm -hmm. So my mom did that. But my grandfather was, um, was a singer. He oh. was, he, he was from Maysville, Kentucky area, right across the river, actually in Ohio, but he was a radio DJ in the forties and fifties in Maysville, Kentucky. That's cool. Which is where Rosemary Clooney is from, uh, which is uh, to put in, to modern day context, she she is in the movie White Christmas that you've probably seen. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, she's also George Clooney's aunt. Oh, interesting. So I figured my, the name had a some had to have to have some yeah. sort of connection there. All the Clooneys are related. They're all <laughs> Irish. They sure. came over, and so my my grandmother is from Maysville, Kentucky, too. She grew up with Rosemary as well, and my my grandfather trained. Nick Clooney, George Clooney's dad in radio, gave him his wow. first job in radio. But those were back in the days where they, they were like, boom, boom, boom. Welcome to the da 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 da. Right, you know, now we're going right. to sing a little song for you, <laughs> you know? And so he would sing like, you know, good morning, whatever. So <laughs> I, I always heard my, I always heard music because he, he would program radio. So there was mm -hmm. always music growing up. He was always singing or bursting into song. Um, and he ended up transitioning into broadcast TV. Mm -hmm. And all of this happened before I was born, but that was who he was. So I think music was very much a part of my life because mm -hmm. he was a part of my life and how much he had influenced my mom. Sure. And I think that's probably why I was singing so loud in the dance class. But it, <laughs> it wasn't until, you know, I, I went to New York as a kid. 
Um, I saw my first Broadway show when I was five and I would go to New York City in just the summers mm -hmm. because I had a modeling contract with Ford Modeling Agency when I was six. Now, this is a crazy story. You didn't ask to hear it, but, but I, I, I won a pageant when I was five. That's awesome. <laughs> and I, I won a new car. Really? At five years old? Who gives a car to a five-year-old? <laughs> I mean, it just seems like not the most practical gift. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> so my mom was like, we'll take the money. And then I guess like six months later, we got invited to go to New York City, all expense paid trip to appear on the Phil Donahue show because they were covering children's pageants. Okay. Well, we get there. No, I've got my new dress. My mom was like, oh my God, we got to go to Kmart and get new clothes. We're going to New York <laughs> City. So we go and I remember having cheesecake. We stayed at the Sheridan Hotel on 7th Avenue. Uh, there was an indoor pool. It was awesome for a kid. Mm -hmm. And when we get there on the day of the show and it ends up being this expose on children's pageants and they completely turn on the parents and the children, they bring out a child, child psychologist. The people in the audience are like, I can't believe you're doing this to your daughter, blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. Well, that was the first time I remember <gasps> experiencing shame now that sure. I know what shame is. And so anyway, we left and my mom was like, I can't believe they had us come all the way. But she was determined to shine the turd. Okay. And as my father said, you turn chicken shit into chicken salad. <laughs> so we. I haven't heard that one. I like that one though. I do too. I love it. <laughs> um, and so she waltzed my little took us all the way over to Ford Modeling Agency and basically was like, I'm here to see the children's division. And they're like, ma'am, you know, you need an appointment. And she's like, well, She's Miss Pee Wee Hemisphere, and we're only here, here till tomorrow. So if you're going to meet her, you're going to need to meet her now. I mean, crazy. <laughs> the ball's on this lady. And so, That's so good. they let her up. Okay, this would not happen today. They would have put her through security. So we go up and they sign me on the spot to a five-year contract. Wow. We, but basically they say, you know, you don't live here. You live in Kentucky. Just come in the summer. Mm -hmm. So this is this long story to get to you how music came into my life. That night I went to see my very first Broadway show, which put music in my life right away. Which show, if you don't mind me asking? Starlight Express, okay. you know, the one on the roller skates. <laughs> um, you may not know, but it's kind of obscure, Andrew Lloyd Webber musical. And, but it was awesome, I loved it. And then in the summertime, I would go, I would come to New York. And part of the thing is, of course, I was doing the modeling, which I found incredibly boring. Um, but what I loved was my mom was sending me to these vocal coaches in New York mm -hmm. and these different people that I began to work with. And they really taught me how to be a singer. And then as I got into high school um, and I went back to Kentucky, mm -hmm. I was dealing with some stuff and I began to write and that's when the songwriting happened because I was I had always been singing for so long and then I began to express myself via the pen uh -huh. and then it kind of popped off the page as songs so as 18 you know I graduated high school and was like okay I kind of want to pursue music mm -hmm. as a career but I had already ha started an acting career mm -hmm. and so I began a band with another girl and it was like a country band but we moved to New York City. We're living in New York City. We were totally in the wrong place. Um, <laughs> but we would perform at CBGBs and wow. Bitter End and these places. We weren't even old enough to get into the places we were performing at. That's awesome, though. CBGBs? Like, yeah. Wow. How, that's like an icon. I mean, obviously, iconic place. Well, so you were, you were, you were always acting, though, because you, you started acting earlier than, obviously, graduating high school, right? Yes. Yeah, so okay. one of the, the moments... I guess uh, the turning point for me in terms of going to New York in the summer, becoming mm -hmm. a full-time thing is uh, the summer I was nine years old. I auditioned for the Radio City Music Hall's Christmas Spectacular. Okay. Which happens every year. It's a Rockettes show mm -hmm. at Christmas they put on. Well, there was the need for a little girl to play Claire in the Nutcracker and do 
this little part in the Christmas Carol and sing all these various different numbers. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up getting this part, but that meant that I had to stay in New York City. Oh, okay. And so I, I went to school in New York during that year, which ended up becoming another year, which ended up becoming another year because um, from that show, the musical director and conductor of that show was writing a brand new musical called, uh, which ended up being called Ruthless eventually. Mm -hmm. And um, in Ruthless, Britney Spears was my understudy and so was Natalie Portman. What? <laughs> yes. How amazing. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, when they say Britney Spears started doing off Broadway, that was the show That's she so started crazy. doing, which was, which was ruthless and wow. crazy. That's, yeah. Wow. Do, do you play guitar or, or an instrument? I do. I don't play well. Okay. Um, I, I started playing when I was around 14 years old. And mm -hmm. as a kid, I played piano. So I think I started playing piano around four or five years old. I'm not, I'm not great with either one of them. I play my voice better okay. um, and my body better. But the way that I write music typically is um, by, by having a concept or an idea for a song and then getting a melody stuck in my head and then tape recording it and then going, okay, now I'm gonna collaborate with someone else who, is a better instrumentalist than I am, but so you, can, you yeah, know, take that to life, so to speak. Yeah. Okay. I was, yeah. I was curious how you started writing. So you started writing like, you know, lyrics and melodies and stuff at how old are you? 15, 16, you said? Say really 16. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then once you graduate, that's when you kind of started this duet with a friend of yeah. yours. Yeah. Amber Rhodes. Yes. Okay. And did you guys, once you're playing these, you know, you're playing CBGBs in different venues and stuff, were you guys like pursuing that? Was that kind of where you wanted to be? And acting was just the thing that was, you know, really paying the bills or kind of what, how did that, how did you juggle between the two? Yeah, it was, it was interesting. It was, it's almost always like, like you're in two race cars okay, and one is kind of got a little bit more gas and is going further and the other one is like okay gotta take a pit stop this one's gonna get ahead you know okay. what I mean it's always sure. like one was and I think when I first came to New York at 18 when I went back to New York Amber and I were there Amber played piano we were writing these songs together we were singing in the subway I mean we were doing all kinds of crazy <laughs> stuff I remember one one time we sang in the subway it, could, it was 100 degrees out it was so hot and we're sitting there sweating. It smells like piss. It's awful. And we, we ended up making $18 in an hour. Wow. On, in 42nd Street. And we left and we went to see the movie Tarzan at the AMC and just soaked up that air conditioning. Um, and of course, we would have gotten a ticket now because I don't think you can do that. But but yeah, we were young and we were stupid, but in the greatest way, in, mm. in the way that naive people, I don't remember somehow we got into a recording studio with Wyclef Jean. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and we were singing country music. Like this was like, we met this manager. I think his name was Jimmy. We met this manager and he was like, kind of thought we were cool because we were doing country mm -hmm. and thought maybe there's a world where we could blend these things. And he was way ahead of his time. Right. Cause now that's happening, which is oh, called yeah. bro country, but, <laughs> but, and I kind of did a little of it, but I think he was just intrigued by us. We were so stupid. We go into these things. We didn't even realize who we were meeting. I mean, I knew who Wyclef was, but I mean, I got such a contact high every time I went anywhere with this guy and, um, but we just sort of willingly went, it was just, it was just interesting and every step of the way. So we hoped that we would take off in music. I think that mm -hmm. was the dream. Sure. I ended up getting a soap opera and that really was to pay the bills. It really was. And, but what happened, you know, what happens is when you go to set every day and you're learning 20 to 30 pages of lines, mm -hmm. you start to get better at that, that at thing. acting, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. So you're like, I'm getting better at this. Uh-huh this one door is opening for me and this other door is 
these are weird doors, you know, like right, right. not sure why Clef's going to make it happen for me in country music. <laughs> right. But this um, is happening. So but this you're going to run with it. Yeah. Right. So it's always like a bird in the hand. And then, and then I did a uh, hairspray, which is uh, a musical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was in the original cast of hairspray. And so that's kind of when finally Amber and I found producers uh, I would write during the day and come and do the show at night. And then on the weekends after two shows on a Saturday, I would go downtown and do a gig. Oh, wow. And it was awesome. It, mm -hmm. I loved it. You know, you're young, you have a lot of energy sure. and we began to really build something at that point. And then we went our separate ways when I think some things for me with the acting began to take me to LA and mm -hmm. kind of took off. I had to make some choices, which were really difficult. Mm -hmm. And I ended up making an album with someone I met in LA that was like old school country. Okay. And it, yeah. Is that longing for a place already gone? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So that was around, that was after you had done Hairspray and you guys kind of, you know, the, the, the duo fizzled and you yeah. moved to Los Angeles, but you're all, you're acting still. Yes. And that was just a record that you're working on, on the side kind of. Yeah. So I think when I was in LA, you know, I was, I, I was developing Legally Blonde that I would go back to New York for, mm -hmm. I would audition for other things. I was broke as hell. <laughs> and then I would just you know, when you're not auditioning, you're not working on a show, you have free time, you don't have mm -hmm. kids, you know, right. um, I began writing with a guy named Larson Payne. And we, we put out this album. And at the same time, I knew Legally Blonde was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so part of the deal in my negotiation with them is that I could sell this album at the show. Oh, that's brilliant. <laughs> and it kind of the pieces finally came together mm -hmm. and I made a decision, you know, here I am, I'm doing this Broadway show. It's having success. Um, and I have every agent and everybody telling me like, you know, you've got to deal with Warner brothers. You need to go to LA and be to LA, or you need to do this next Broadway show or that thing. And they really want to propel the acting career. Mm -hmm. And I was like, no, I'm moving to Nashville. <laughs> and they're like, what pin drop <laughs> um and so yeah you could hear a pin drop but it was like a bomb went off sure <laughs> and and so i thought that i would move to nashville i would just get an apartment i would integrate myself i met i got connected you know through the various circles um with a manager named Stuart dill who was essentially like my godfather Okay. When I, of, of coming into Nashville, it was like, listen, this is a small community. You, you need to integrate yourself in this community so that they respect you. And this is authentic. And of course you're from Kentucky and you've been writing country music and you've been singing it for a long time. You just haven't mm -hmm. been doing that in Nashville. Mm -hmm. And so I started taking these trips on my day off from Legally Blonde to Nashville, meeting with people, meeting with writers, um, looking at apartments that I was going to rent. And I ended up going to like the CMT awards or something into a party and getting connected with a woman named Autumn House, who was at the time at Capitol Records. And I met with her. I met with a guy named Joe Fisher, Universal. And one thing led to another. By the time I left Legally Blonde, I was mm -hmm. offered two different record deals. Wow. And... um. And so my move to Nashville was not, uh, I mean, I was very, very fortunate that it wasn't the slugging way that I thought it was going to be. But mm. for sure, when I moved to Nashville, I integrated myself into the community. And I, you know, if I listen to the songs that I wrote before that time, I'm like, oh God, oh God, I can't listen. I can't listen. Because moving to Nashville I really learned to become a songwriter mm -hmm. and I understood, I began to learn the art of production and I think I really became an artist there. Mm -hmm. I wasn't really one before I got there, mm -hmm. you know, but I thought I was. <laughs> Well, you put a record out and you're singing and, <laughs> right. you know, acting. I mean, I would say <laughs> you're an artist. 
but yeah, so that was that. So that was really when it all kind of came together. The music really kind of took sure. off. Yeah. When when you got there, did you feel like there would be like some stigma that you're an actress and you're moving there to pursue something? But like, oh well, now she wants to be a country singer. But it was like, no, I've been doing this forever. Yeah, I, I definitely because there was that stigma. Mm -hmm. because that was feedback from people, you know, she's an actress or she was on Broadway. Um, when, when really I'm like, no, <laughs> I was mm -hmm. raised in Kentucky and I've been singing country music For since sure. I was a teenager. <laughs> um, so I guess there was half, I, there was a little fight for authenticity. Mm -hmm. Um, but and I was different. I, I have to say, I know that I was a different artist because I had already spent years performing and understanding an audience. I knew when people wanted to go see a show that they wanted to see a show. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to listen to a show. They didn't want to see you stand there completely still. They would rather just cook a meal in their kitchen listening to your album. They want to sure. see something. So I put on a very visual show, which made me a, an artist that was quite different than other artists, which in some ways was polarizing. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And I was going to say, because you had, you already had the stage presence, obviously, and you've been on stage forever. So it wasn't like you'd go up there and it wasn't, you know, the timid, like, oh, okay, I'm going to play this. Like you already had kind of that in your repertoire of things that you already knew how to do. There were like backup dancers and <laughs> shimmy dresses. And we were doing like Tina Turner, proud Mary full out. That's amazing. <laughs> um, you should have seen it too. And it was crazy, you know, crazy times too. You know, I had a majority black band uh -huh. uh, and we played country music sure. and we would show up at these festivals and, you know, people had Confederate flags and it was just, I look back on that time now and I'm like, holy crap, why didn't I turn the bus around? Right. Yeah, that's. I would have handled it much differently now, but they were amazing. My band was <laughs> very good at making jokes about things, which mm -hmm. I'm sure things bothered them. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised uh, with that. The, like you, so you did tour with, with that record. Wow. What was that like? Was it different than doing like a Broadway show every night? <laughs> <laughs> was it different? Oh my God. You know, we're, we're, we're playing, obviously I'm in a, I'm in a bus. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm not, sometimes we fly, but most of the time we're, we're taking a bus out and we're leaving at nine o'clock at night and sleeping in their little teeny, you know, um, uh, coffin bed sure <laughs> and then we wake up and we're wherever you know i remember one time i remember waking up and we were at the uh Na we were nascar what's the daytona 500 we were at okay. the daytona and i woke up to vroom, vroom, <laughs> you know and you're like oh my god where am i, I forgot where i was um but yeah we'd go to these festivals we'd be in the middle of nowhere without service and we'd walk outside and it's you know we're playing a, an atv festival and everybody's on their ATV going up right. and down the hill. And in order for us to get to the stage, we've all got to take an ATV. <laughs> so by the time we get there, we're covered in mud. We do our show. I do a meet and greet afterwards. Everybody wants to hug, you know, of course. within a meet and greet. And I'm just covered in mud and everybody else's <laughs> mud. And, and that was actually one of my favorite shows because you you look out and everybody's sitting on their ATV. So they've got their lights on. That's cool. It was, it was awesome. Like, it was before it's time, before the drive-in shows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, totally. Like it was kind of a quarantined way, but we did all these like fun festivals. Of course, it's a lot of radio, six o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning, five o'clock in the morning, and then you're still doing your show at nine o'clock, 10 o'clock sure. at night. So I was tired um, mm -hmm. on some of those days, but yeah, it was definitely different. And I really, my I was so fortunate that um, I was able to tour internationally too. Oh, wow. And um, I, we toured in with the, the Aiken and Shaken album ha is a gold album in Norway. <laughs> That's awesome. I know you had a big hit off of the record. I was giddy on up. Yeah. But it was so random that Norway. Okay. I think maybe <laughs> they thought I was Norwegian. I don't know. Um, I, in my, in my 23 and me 
I, I do have a little Scandinavian. Oh, but, there um, you go. But yeah, that was amazing. So we went to Norway, we went to Sweden, we played in Ireland, England, um, Australia, Italy, Switzerland was my favorite. We went there twice. Why was that, just the crowd or the venue? Well, we played, well, what I found was so interesting is anytime there was a country music festival in Sweden or Switzerland, Norway, these types of places, it was very um, gimmicky for them. So, they would be all dressed in like Western, the people that would come. And the, it was like, uh, and even in Italy, this happened. Like I showed up in Italy, Vaguera, I think it was. And it was almost like a, almost like where they shot the spaghetti Westerns. Okay. And there was like, um, uh, um, all these cowboys and it was just it was it was crazy they were like in full chaps the <laughs> the audience they were in chaps and these you know just fully embracing it. down the <laughs> girls had the you know they look like ellie may clamp it it was it was <laughs> it was fascinating it was like what they had thought country music was based on television in 1960 sure and then we show up and we do our show which was fairly modern right and mm -hmm. um but I loved it. I just loved it. I thought those crowds were amazing and really fun. And I, I love to travel. So I thought Switzerland was such a beautiful, uh, one of the most stunning places I've ever been because we were right in the middle of the Alps. Wow. And it was just, amazing. I, mean, I ended up shooting a music video while I was there and was like, oh. we got to shoot, we got to shoot something here. We're going to rent a helicopter. <laughs> My friend Becky Fluke was with us and she's an amazing director. She shot a lot of Miranda Lambert stuff. Oh, cool. Little Big Town and all Chris Stapleton stuff. She goes on the road with him and she's game for anything. And I'm like, okay, we're going to shoot this like sound of music. I'm going to go to the top of that mountain. They're going to drop me off. I'm going to hold up this sign in the air and then the helicopter's going to go over like this. So she's like, okay, I'm going to hang out of the helicopter. She hung out of a damn helicopter. I'm standing on a mountain that I don't think anybody has traversed because there's no trails on it. <laughs> it was crazy, but it was, you know, those types of memories, those crazy things that you do, it, those are peak experiences in life. For sure, that's cool. What song did you shoot the video for? It was called I Am What I Am. Okay, that's awesome. That's really cool that you're able to shoot out there with, just like on the, on the fly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so no permits. Yeah, sure. <laughs> uh, the next record you you did was another piece of me, and that album was 2015. Um, <laughs> what would you say? Like the, I'm sure you're probably acting in the in in between the two albums, but what would you say like the milestone from that record was? I know you got signed to Big Machine, which is huge. Um, I think I think I guess Two Step doing well, um, and establishing, um. Establishing this idea that a woman can take hip hop beats and country samples and make, mm -hmm. you know, a, a funky country dance song. Sure. I, I, it was similar to getting on up in that way, but this really did have more hip hop in it. So that was a milestone. Um, but I would say, actually, as a songwriter, um, I felt like I had some milestones. Okay. So while nobody else would really n know, um, I think close to one of my favorite songs I've ever written was China and Wine, which I wrote with Natalie Hemby. Mm -hmm. And um, th that's a very personal song about, you know, my coping with my parents splitting up as a child and those memories and then moving on and dealing with my own um, uh, inability to commit, <laughs> commit my commitment phobia, but then getting beyond it. And mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think for that, the the songwriting for sure and also i directed all the music videos off of that album wow so i think what happened for me in nashville i really umg nashville was the first place to really acknowledge that i was an artist beyond singing and beyond songwriting and they gave me a lot of freedom when it came to 
my music videos, the content I created and my marketing. And I was included in all my marketing meetings. And then they, and they allowed me to direct my music videos. So um, that had happened with my, my second album, another that's piece a, of me. That's huge too, to have that, all the creative control that way. Or usually they're like, you're going to do this and we have this idea and you're going to do this. Yeah. I always said they gave me enough rope to hang myself. <laughs> and I did. I did hang myself. Why do you say that? Well, um, I really was not concerned about creating music that would work for the radio. Okay. Especially with my first project with them, with Aiken and Shaken. I had was more about concepts. You know, I wanted to do Aiken and Shaken this side. The Aiken side is the slow side. You heartbreak to it. You know, you uh, you cook to it. You make out to it. And the Shaken side, you work out to, you dance to, you get over the breakup with, to. So they were different sides you listen to. So I was caught up in that and these two different styles and wanting to do something cool like take Motown and bluegrass music mm -hmm. and make um, songs that way, sure. almost like a Amy Winehouse of country. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I was interested in. I wasn't interested in making music for the radio, which is what the label is interested in. Right, <laughs> of course. <laughs> and eventually I think, you know, that's, that's where things became difficult, where, um, you know, the label's like, oh, don't see a hit here. Don't see a radio. Don't see a radio. And it was hard for me because every time I listened to country radio, I was like, this song? This song? Really? <laughs> right. I understand. I was like, I, I know this artist has better songs because I've heard them. Right. You know, and then I would be like, this is what they chose for the radio. So I just don't think I, I think I was a little out of touch with what radio was looking for. Okay. But, um, but I also do listen to my album and go, I don't understand why some of this stuff wasn't, you know, I didn't, mm -hmm. I was never interested in being a copycat. What I realized about playing on the radio meant your song had to sound like the song that just came out before it. And the only way you were going to be able to do something new and fresh is if you had already gotten a number one by being a copycat before that. And mm -hmm. then you'd be able to, you know, okay. you can, the third you know time I mean? around. Like, yeah. Oh, Okay, you gotta, you gotta, they gotta feel safe with you. Sure. Before sure. they go, you know, yeah, jump you off you the give cliff. them one hip, yeah, one certain, and then you totally change. They're like, whoa, wait, what? <laughs> but I feel like coming to this new record, the new, the new song I heard doesn't sound anything like those past three records. <laughs> So tell me about your new album. And I love the video. I got a chance to see the video um, for the song that's coming out on the 5th. It, it's, it's genius. I love it. Oh, thank you so much. I so appreciate that. So, well, to say the least, this has been a departure okay. from my other music. And I think also the, the feeling of my, my music in general uh, I would say with getting on up, it's always been female empowerment, right? Strong women. Mm -hmm. But I decided I really wanted to make an album that specifically dealt with different issues that women were facing today. So each song does that. It's almost like a soundtrack to the women's movement. Okay. And the idea came about, I did this concert called Double Standards um, where two... There was like Broadway stars, pop stars, comedians, two women came together mm -hmm. to sing a duet on a jazz standard with a little bit of a spin. And we raised money for um, these different female uh, empowering uh, causes, right? Okay. So uh -huh. uh, women's health and women's rights. So AC, we raised money for hundred over a hundred thousand dollars for ACLU, Planned Parenthood, and the National wow. Breast Cancer Coalition. Amazing. And uh with Sarah Bareilles and Rosie O'Donnell and all these different women of Broadway, like Jesse Mueller and Danae Benton, Ingrid Michaelson. Mm -hmm. Um it was really an amazing night. And from that, I thought I need to make an album. So as I went to make an album, what happened is because I'm a songwriter, I kept writing original songs, but in the style of a standard. Okay, sure. So there's a little bit of a throwback mm -hmm. in terms of this 
the sound, you know, like that 50s jazz, yeah. but meets pop. So I guess a lot of people are actually doing that in pop right now, like Lana Del Rey or whoever, taking sort of vintage elements of music and, in, and including those with modern elements of pop. So mm -hmm. that's kind of the idea. And then each song deals with a different issue. So whether it was a song called Sick of Saying Sorry that deals with women over apologizing because we apologize like 80% more than men. <laughs> um, it deals with equal pay. There's a song called Money Ho. That's oh, also that's got awesome. a little hip hop beats in it. Um, there is a song called Get a Girl You Go, which was previously released that is about breaking the glass ceiling. And the video mm -hmm. for that um, featured all of the women, all of the Democratic women running for national office in 2020. Okay. And, and then there's, uh, I did a cover of Girls Just Want to Have Fun. Yeah, I love the, that too. And the video, uh, it's a very slowed down sort of haunting orchestral version of the song. Mm -hmm. But the video deals with a woman's journey from the beginning of the end of an abusive relationship because one in four women uh, experience domestic violence in their lifetime, which is crazy. That statistic That's, is crazy. Chances yes. are, you know someone, but you don't know, right? Right, yeah. And so I definitely wanted to deal with that uh, it didn't feel like that was an original song. It felt like that was better dealt with a video of this particular song. But mm -hmm. so then that leads to American Girl coming out. Yes. And this um, song is, it's amazing. Oh, thank you. It deals really with, uh, I would say, you know, as women, there's all these expectations of us. There's mm -hmm. always been expectations of us. But as young girls were, hey, here's that baby doll. Here's that Barbie. So you should grow up to want to have babies. Here's a doll house so we can teach you how to keep a house together real <laughs> early. Um, here's a Barbie. You should look like this. And we kind of sell women this this idea that their life will not be complete without the picket fence, without the diamond ring, mm -hmm. without the kids, without those shoes, without that nose, without that dress. And so not only do we create this sort of unattainable goal, mm -hmm. we get them to look away from themselves and not see that inside there's this power and there's fire burning. And I think it's a substitute because society can't provide for us all the opportunities we want to have for ourselves. So instead they're like, buy all this shit, you'll be happy. Sure. And so then we, we try to buy all that shit to be happy and we're not happy and we're in debt because we're buying all of it. And we wake up and at some point in our lives, we look back and we're like, what did I do with my life? I wanted to do all these things. Mm -hmm. And even if we had done all those things, we'd have probably hit the glass ceiling and realized we couldn't. So that's what the song is about. It's basically saying I'm an American girl in a first problem world, mm -hmm. which is ironic because I'm fully aware of why it's so, I'm fully aware that it's a silly thing to say because my basic needs are met. Sure. But we're, American women are still struggling with all of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That they have of what success is supposed to be. And this video is basically saying, this is bullshit. It does, yeah, and the way you do it is so brilliant. Like the, the each individual like scene, like that show, that's, that's like demonstrating everything you're talking about is so well done. I was telling my wife, I was like, my favorite part of the video is when you're, you know, you're showing the bottom of your Louis Vuittons and then you're walking away and there's the, and the, the red is leaving the blood on the ground. I'm like, that was like the most brilliant thing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Um, yeah, I, I, the idea is that we bleed ourselves dry to afford these really nice things that mm -hmm. some magazine said was worthy of us liking when I'm pretty sure you could get the same look in shoes at nine West and paint the bottom of them red. I was just about to say that <laughs> you could probably just find a pair of shoes, paint the bottom red and there you go. Right. But it's, it's that is the idea. So there's a lot of that. There's the eggs in the freezer. There's a scene. Oh yeah, that was 
the line like the lyrics too are like this is so creative like uh, yeah beyond me well i tell you um you know i can't take full credit for it i have two other songwriters and producers on this album that I've, we've written everything together. Mm -hmm. We've produced everything together. And that is Shay Carter and Jeremy Edelman. And, um, you know, Shay and I, we, we do the lyrics, uh, we're responsible because we're the women. I mean, Jeremy's mm -hmm. contributed. He, he, <laughs> he definitely contributes here and now, especially for money. Ho, he really enjoyed <laughs> that one. But really Shay and I, this was a really deeply personal song to both of us. Mm -hmm. I think where we're really just all of these songs on this album, we're talking about our experience of being a woman and we share different insights because we're at different places in our lives. I'm, I'm married now and I have a kid and mm -hmm. that my understanding of being a woman has really evolved and changed post childbirth sure. and postpartum and, um, and just seeing like, there's just not enough time to do anything. <laughs> um, but for her, she's in that place where, you know, she's trying to make that decision of, she just got her, she just froze her eggs like a couple days ago, which is so hilarious because we talk about it in the song. She, she froze her eggs because she's like, well, I want kids, but I don't want them now. And I don't know if this guy that I'm with now is the one, and I don't want to put pressure on the relationship because of it. Mm -hmm. And I've got all these dreams and these goals, but like, I was sold that story. I should probably have kids and I believe it and I want it. And I took the pill, mm -hmm. but I like the pill, you know? So, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. It's in such a different world, especially now. I mean, it's everyone's yeah. Instead of like the nine to five, that's not even a thing really. It's like grind, grind, grind. And then, yeah. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, now I'm, you know, this old, like what happened? Yeah, it's it is really tricky. I think there must be some sort of solution mm -hmm. for us. I haven't figured out. I'm still <laughs> trying to figure it out. But sure. if you, you know, we spend all this time. You know, obviously, social media has made this really hard. We we curate our lives so we can present them to other people we don't know or know well to like us, mm -hmm. right? To like our posts and our things. And we base a lot of our value on that when really like it takes us out of the present and the value is in just like being there, being present and like growing from all of our ugliness that we are so afraid to share with people. Right. We're so afraid to show ugly pictures or like some macaroni that's all over the plate or I don't mean I don't know. It's never <laughs> like it's always got to be super glamorous and like I'm here in Lake Tahoe or whatever. <laughs> there is this woman named Celeste Barber. Uh-huh. Do you know she's and she's speaking of Instagram? No. Oh, I get this so much enjoyment. She's a comedian. Okay. But she will take like this this magazine a video of like this hot model or pop star or something and she will do her own oh, like, like a duet of it kind version of, of it. well <laughs> it's not it's not singing really ever okay but she posts like if a model is like walking or she's in the ocean and like you know or under a waterfall or something like she'll do like the janky ass <laughs> um basic woman version of it Okay. It is so funny. I <laughs> I get so much joy from this woman. Oh, I love I need her to so check much. Check her out. That's so funny. Oh. <laughs> oh, well, so the record's coming out in a, in a few weeks. What are you most excited about for the album? Aside from you know all the hard work you put into it. You know, this is a different project for me. This isn't about me being an artist. Mm -hmm. and my music this is really about educating and inspiring women this is more about a movement and I, I think my goals are different than they ever have been you know my goals are that this reaches as many women as possible and that they hear it and it speaks to them and it makes them believe 
that they can be all that they thought they could be before society told them different and that they fight for what they deserve because we are over 50% of the population. We make 80% of the consumer decisions. We birth the human race. We deserve equality. And sometimes it's much easier to hear these messages when they're inside of a pretty melody than it is on the news or in a book or something like that. So I guess my goal is that I really do hope that this puts a fire inside of the women who listen to this and, um, and inspires them. And then I, and then my other goal is I'm going to turn it into a Broadway show, a la vagina monologues. (laughs) Oh, I love that. (laughs) That is awesome. Well, thank you so much, Laura, for talking with me today. This has been so amazing. I really appreciate you. Yeah. I've had a great time talking to you too. I do have one more question uh, before I let you go though. I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists. Oh, so much. <laughs> I really think it's about, there's a, there's a show called Gypsy and there's a song called You Gotta Get a Gimmick. And I think, um, I think sometimes artists can really just go swimming in this massive pool of their creativity. But really what allows them to cut through is by realizing what is the thing about them that is different? What is the thing about you that you're actually afraid to show people or is unique about you? And lean into that, whether that's your background, your heritage, um, leaning into that musically, but in a more modern pop way, or is your voice different? Lean into it. How can you, you know, Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think take what you think is your weakness and make it your uniqueness. And that is what is going to make you cut through because it's really all about the story that people can create, you know, and want to tell about you. Not the fact that you're just like everybody else. You might not get played on the radio, but do you know what I mean? You're going to begin to cut through. I love that. Take your weakness and make that your uniqueness. I've never heard that before. That's brilliant. 